All right, I'm going to read from two scriptures because I couldn't choose between them. They're too good. So our first scripture is going to be Revelation chapter 1. We're going to start in verse 4. It says, Grace and peace to you from Him who is and who was and who is to come. And from the seven spirits before His throne and from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead and the ruler of the kings of the earth. To Him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by His blood and has made us to be a kingdom and priests to serve His God and Father to Him. Be the glory and the power forever and ever. And the church said... Matthew chapter 6, starting in verse 9. This is when the disciples come to Jesus and they ask the wonderful question that we all should ask. Lord, teach us to pray. How do you pray like that? And he says, this then is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. You may be seated. We're continuing our series this morning in, uh, it's called, what is it called? That was weak, but we've got more weeks to go, so it's all going to be okay. Thy kingdom come. And so we're talking about and answering the question, why did Jesus show up? Why did Jesus come to earth? Because look, you're going to hear a lot of people say a lot of different things about why Jesus came and who he was and what his purpose was and what he was doing. You hear people say, well, he was just a good man or a good teacher or a good moralist or a good ethicist. But Jesus came and said, no, 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 I'm the king. He said, I'm not some great teacher or just a wise man. I am your king and I deserve your worship and your surrender, which is what this series is all about, surrendering to our king. So uh, before we get into our lesson, uh, I just thought I would update you on our running story for the past few weeks. Uh, last week we ended by an anonymous person giving me the, uh, the, the PPTP. Uh, for my son. If you don't know what I'm talking about, it's okay. Just don't worry about it. But I found the culprit. And she's here. Everybody look at Pam Scarborough and give her a round of applause. Yeah. Hey, Pam, they work so well. I, it, it was amazing. So, and by the way, it saved me at 2.30 this morning once again. So thank you. Uh, still, it's the gift that keeps on giving. I really appreciate that. So I thought I would put the story to rest. Um, we figured it all out. That was really fun. Thank you. Uh, I have a bracelet that I love. Uh, I've worn this thing. You, you ever had like a piece of jewelry or something? Yeah, but you don't take that thing off. Like you, you sleep with it, you shower with it, you swim with it. Like this, this is a part of me. Well, that, that is my bracelet. I, I love this thing. Uh, it's a black bracelet and it's got some symbols on it. And the symbols are what make it so special. It's the symbols of the gospel. And so there's a down arrow representing the incarnation that Jesus came to earth. There's a cross representing the fact that he died. A tomb representing his burial. An up arrow representing that he conquered the grave. And another down arrow at the end saying that Jesus is coming back again. Our series is called Thy Kingdom Come. And that's, that's what I kept thinking about was my bracelet. And, and uh, as much as I love this bracelet, I've got some sad news. If, as you see, I'm not wearing my bracelet this morning. Uh... I went to the hospital when Jude was born, and uh, they, like, thankfully are really secure with who takes the baby home. That's like an important thing these days, go figure. And so they put a bracelet on me, and then they put a matching bracelet on him so that I'm the only one that can take him. And so when I got home, look, those things, it, they, they put it on too tight. I couldn't get that thing off, and so I slid a knife underneath it, and I pulled it, and there went my bracelet. <laughs> Five years I hadn't taken it off. 
and I lost it. So I'm determined to get another one because those symbols, I mean, look, wearing that bracelet was an awesome thing because people would just see it and ask you about the symbols and it was automatically a talking point for Jesus. You know, I got to tell them the story of Jesus and what he means to me just because I'm wearing a bracelet. And that didn't happen every day or something, but I had several conversations with people saying, I really like, what is that? And then as you explain it, there's a sense of respect. That even, even people who weren't Christians have a respect for someone who is confident in their faith. Nobody wants somebody who's claiming to be a Christian, but then not going to be confident in Christ. They, they respect someone who's going to stand up for what you believe in. So it was a really awesome piece of jewelry. So I, I plan to get another one. Uh, I, I'm still working on that. But I, I loved that bracelet. But you know, when Jesus came the first time and brought His kingdom and came to this earth and was uh, incarnate here with us, people weren't wearing jewelry. Right? Like they, they weren't wearing bracelets and putting this cross jewelry on. And, and, and even today you'll see people who put tattoos on of, of the cross or different things. You see that all the time. And, and when you put something on a tattoo, you're, you're saying, I permanently believe in what I'm putting on my body. And some people have made some big mistakes <laughs> with some things they've put on, on the tattoos. So anyway, uh, people weren't getting tattoos the first time Jesus came. They weren't wearing the, the cross necklaces. They weren't wearing the gospel bracelets. And it's not that they weren't looking for a king. Because they were. Right? Like they, they, they anticipated that a king was coming. And they were waiting for the king. They were waiting for the Messiah. They were praying for him to be here. But then when he showed up, they missed it. Now, now how in the world did they not recognize Jesus? Because look, he's going around and he's performing some incredible miracles, right? He's walking on the water. He's feeding 5,000 people with a sack lunch, right? I, I mean, he, he's, he's uh, turning water into wine. He's casting out demons and then he's raising people from the dead. How can you not recognize Jesus as king? And I'll tell you why. It's not because of the actions he did, but because of the company that he kept. You see, in their minds, Jesus was hanging around a bunch of people who they believed was not fit for a king. Let me give you an example. Turn to Mark chapter 2. We're going to start in verse 13. Are you there? All right. Once again, Mark chapter 2, verse 13. It says, Once again, Jesus went out beside the lake, and a large crowd came to him, and Jesus began to teach them. And as he walked along, he saw Levi, the son of Alphaeus, sitting at the tax collector's booth. Follow me, Jesus said to him. And Levi got up and he followed him. And while Jesus was having dinner at Levi's house, many tax collectors and sinners were eating with him and his disciples. For there were many who followed him. But when the teachers of the law, who were Pharisees, saw him eating with these sinners and these tax collectors, they asked his disciples, Why does he eat with sinners? I like the New Living Translation there. It says, Why does he eat with scum? Now, this may seem harsh to you at first until you understand that this belief was consistent with the theology of the Pharisees. Theology is the study of God. Their belief in who God was shaped their belief in this moment. They believed in God and they loved God. And they were religious people. And, and, and so as you come to this moment, listen, let me tell you this. The most important thing you think on this earth is what you think about God. Because what you think about God shapes what you think about everything else. And because of what they thought about God, they looked at God and they realized the truth that God hates sin. Therefore, they concluded God hates sin. Sinners. And so Levi, in this moment, 
He's not just some sinner. In their eyes, He's worse than just a sinner. He's scum. And of all the scum, He's the worst of them all. Because Levi was a tax collector. And so let me tell you a little bit about what a tax collector was. The Roman Empire. They're, they're, they're big and they're powerful. So how are they going to keep law and order and peace and discipline in their land when they cover so much territory? How are they possibly going to be able to do that? Well, they hired soldiers to go out and to enforce that discipline and enforce that peace. And, and, and if you broke the rules or broke the law then you're handled by these soldiers. Now, how in the world can they afford to pay for all of those soldiers to go all over that land to keep the discipline? They had tax collectors. And these tax collectors were natives of the land. It was people who lived there and had family there and had friends there and they would hire them and they would say, you go to the land and take the taxes and collect them for us and give them to the kingdom. Now, here's the funny thing. The tax collectors weren't paid by the king and the kingdom. Rather, they were told by the king that whatever you can extort above the cut of the kingdom, you can keep. And so Levi... He's not just a bad man. He's not just a cheater. He's a traitor. He's scum. And so they expected that when Jesus, their king, would come to the earth, he would walk up to somebody like Levi and he would say, How dare you? And instead, Jesus walks up and he says, Why don't you? Why don't you come and follow me? Let's be friends. Let's hang out. Let's go get some coffee. And, and then Levi looks at, at Jesus, I imagine. I'm, I'm inferring a little bit here in our text, but I just can't help but picture this scene. As Levi looks at Jesus, and he goes, wait, you're you talking to, to him, right? Surely you're not talking. You don't know who I am, Jesus. No, I, I know who you are, Levi. But you don't know what I do. No, I, I know you're a tax collector and you're a traitor and you've let your country and your nation and your people down and your family down and, 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 and I get it. You've stolen and cheated and lied. I know who you are. Come and follow me. I still want you. And for the first time in Levi's many, many years, he feels wanted by someone. And it's not just anyone. It's the king. And he says, come on, follow me. And so... Levi says, well, you know what? I, he takes advantage of the situation, you know? Like, this is, this is getting really good. Maybe I can push it one step. Further. Hey, Jesus, I got a lot of friends. Like, I got, I got a lot of buddies, and I might have lost all my old friends that I grew up with, but I got a lot of other tax collectors and sinners because they're the only people that will accept me because the religious people and the good people and the godly people, they don't want to have anything to do with me, but I've got some friends. Hey, how about you come to my house, and we have supper, we have dinner, and I'll invite all my buddies to come with us. And Jesus went. And the Internet went crazy. And people started posting pictures on the Facebook and the Instagram of Jesus eating with tax collectors and sinners. What is he doing? And that is exactly why Jesus went in the first place. Look at your text. Verse 16, when the teachers of the law and the Pharisees saw them eating with the tax collectors and sinners, they asked the disciples, why does he eat with them? Why is he eating with such scum like Levi and his buddies? And on hearing this, Jesus looked to them and he said, it's not the healthy. I, by the way, can I pause here? This is one of the coolest metaphors in all of Scripture right here. I love this text. He says, it's not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick and he said, I've not come to call the righteous, but sinners. Back to the New Living Translation again. It's not a, a translation I use often, but it's got, so it, a lot of times it's got some neat ways to say things. And I read it here again. I really liked it. It said, I have not come to call those who think they are righteous, but those who know they are sinners. So the question of the series, thy kingdom come. Jesus, why are you here? What are you doing? 
Why did you bring your kingdom? And he says, I came for sinners. Jesus came to bring a different kind of kingdom to this world. One like no one had ever seen before. And, and they were looking for their king. And they expected a kingdom. And they thought that th this kingdom would be a, a kingdom of power, a kingdom of might, where we can go and conquer and take names. And, and man, he, Jesus is going to come in. And we're going to be prosperous. And we're going to conquer and then when Jesus came in, he said, no, 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 I'm bringing a different kind of kingdom. And that bothered some people. They didn't like that. But they could kind of accept it. You can't, if you read the scriptures, you see they, they more or less accept sometimes of the kingdom that Jesus has brought. I hesitate to say they accepted it because they really didn't. But at some level, they were more okay with accepting that fact that this isn't the case. I mean, Jesus comes in and he's riding on a donkey and yet the people are out there celebrating and laying down the palm branches. They accepted the kind of kingdom that Jesus was going to bring, although they didn't like it. But what they couldn't accept was that Jesus not only was coming to bring a different kingdom, he was coming to bring a different kind of people into it. And they couldn't accept the kind of people that Jesus accepted. But Jesus said, I came for the sick, not the healthy. I had to tell you a, a really cool illustration that I've heard before. I just clicked a button and my whole sermon went away. Is, uh, there it comes, it came back. 1990 is when this happened. And there was a, a, a couple that was engaged to be married. And uh, so they go down to the Hyatt. And they're going to throw their big wedding party and have the wedding and have the reception down here at the Hyatt. And it was a really expensive deal. It was a $10,000 down payment for this room or this, uh, you know, situation at the Hyatt. And just before the wedding happened, the man got cold feet and he left. And so the... the, the the woman goes downstairs and, and, and is asking the receptionist for her money back. And in the fine print of the contract that they signed, it said that she could only be given back $1,000 of the $10,000 deposit. And the woman said, I'm sorry, I wish there was something I could do. I know this is a terrible situation for you. She said, you, you can take the $1,000 or you can go ahead and have your party. I mean, it's all ready. You might as well. And that's what she did. She had her party in the Hyatt, without her husband, a wedding party. I mean, nobody was getting married. But here's some context to the story. Ten years earlier, she was homeless. And she was living on the streets, and she finally got into a homeless shelter, and she lived in this homeless shelter. So she decides to call the homeless shelter and told them, I want you to call all of the people on the streets and let them know that there's a party for them at the Hyatt. And so all of a sudden, all these alcoholics and drug addicts, the, the scum of the world, some would say, the prostitutes all come into the Hyatt, into this $10,000 deposit room, and they party like you've never seen before. And the people at the Hyatt, they were kind of a little like, whoa, this is crazy, but they liked it. It, it was neat. It was different. And, and so she threw the same party that she was going to throw for herself in her marriage party. But the only difference of the whole night was that she changed the menu. In honor of the groom, she had boneless chicken. <laughs> and I love that story. Because I think that that is exactly what the kingdom of God is going to look like. When, when Jesus comes back and the great wedding banquet is had and all the people gather around Jesus' table, it's going to be full of broken people. It's going to be full of a bunch of people who others would look at and say, they're not fit for a king. And Jesus says, but they're exactly why I came. I love it. I love it. Here's the deal. The most amazing thing about the kingdom of God, I believe, as I've been studying through some of this, is that the one condition for entering it is admitting that you're not fit for it. To look at yourself and say, I don't belong here. And, and when you admit that, now you belong here. 
Verse 17. I've not come for those who think they are righteous, but those who know they are sinners. Now, I know this is a uh, very um, controversial statement in Scripture. I know that this statement offends several people, especially secular people. Because here's, here's what secular ideology is like. They hate the concept of sin. Can we agree with that? The reason that secular people hate the concept of sin is because sin implies that there is moral authority, that there are moral absolutes, and that there is determined judgment that is to come. And they don't like that idea. Secular people have the, con the idea that truth is within, not without. There's nothing outside of me that determines truth. I decide what's right and true for me, and you decide what's true for you. Don't judge me. And so we have this screwed up theology, I believe it's screwed up theology of where truth is found. And we choose to try to find truth from within. Therefore, we don't like Jesus as a redeemer. We like Jesus as a cheerleader. Because Jesus as a redeemer implies that there is sin for him to save me from. And that means that there's a truth outside of myself in which I have to submit to. And I don't like that concept. But you know what the really funny thing is? that religious people don't like that idea either. You know, one of the things that I believe makes religion so popular in our society is that we have this morality grid. When, when, we, when we come to Jesus, we get this morality grid and we get a, a set of laws and a set of rules by which we can look out and we can judge whether or not people are fit or not. Whether they're good or they're bad, whether they're saved or they're lost, and we get to look at this code, at, at, this, at this morality grid, and, and see people through that lens and say, no, no, you're still messed up. You're not good enough. We do that with individuals. We do that with churches as well on a church level. We look at, I mean, there's, there's times we won't have fellowship with another church because they worship in a different way than we do. Jesus said, I came for sinners, for broken people. And this is not some game that you can play, God. This is me coming to heal you in your brokenness. You follow me? That's tough, isn't it? You want me step off your toes for just a second? Because I want, I want to tell you what I'm not saying. Because if you're careful, you're going to hear something I'm not saying. And I don't want you to hear what I'm not saying. I want you to hear what I am saying. And what I'm saying... I'm not saying that sin's no big deal. I'm not saying that following the Word of God is not important because I absolutely believe it. Why do you think I'm a minister if I don't love the Word of God? I mean, it's in the center of our vision statement. But if we want to lo look like Jesus more than anything else, we're going to have to learn to like the kind of people that Jesus likes. And He likes some pretty sick people. I'm not saying sin's no big deal. I'm saying that none of us can claim that we're that good. We have to learn to accept that Jesus came as a redeemer, not a cheerleader. And he came for sick and broken people like me and you. You know, there's some pretty broken people in this world, aren't there? It's a pretty messed up time around us right now. Compared to what we've been through in the past. I, I, by the way, can I just, can I give you a little bit of hope? This is not the worst that the world has ever been. The, the world is not in the worst state that it's ever been. It may be in the worst that you've ever seen it in your lifetime. But I promise you, this world has been covered with much more sin than it even is now. It just doesn't feel that way sometimes. But don't let the world fool you. Don't start thinking, oh no, if this person gets elected, we're all going to die. It's not that bad. Because Christ is king. And he's bigger than any one man in an a, a, a oval office. He's on the throne of God. Sitting at the right hand of the throne of God. And he's watching and he's taking care of us. It's not that bad. Can, can everybody just... Can you just... It's going to be okay. I'm not saying that sin's okay. There's sin around us, and I'm not saying that it's okay. Don't hear what I'm not saying. 
But I'm saying that Jesus is greater. And he's the king. I know a couple of guys I want to tell you about. One I've told you about before. His name is Michael Bingham. And uh, Michael was in... Uh, he stole uh, a car. He, uh, I mean, he, he committed all sorts of crimes, was stealing things, was violent. Ended up getting in prison for 17 years, and he looked rough. You see some of those mug shots of people who have been convicted and in prison, and, and you see them taking those things, and they have the tattoos all over them, and they're just that mean snarl, and they just look rough. I mean, look, if there was anyone in this world who would be considered scum, Michael Bingham would have been him. You follow me? Trent Langhofer is another one that I know. And, and, and Trent, he didn't want to do and live the life that his parents wanted him to live. And he didn't want to follow the, the faith that his parents had. And so he rebelled against them. He was lazy, didn't want to get a job, didn't want to work, didn't want to take orders from anybody else except himself. And so he finds himself in the streets of New Orleans, homeless for months and months, a broken individual. You know some people who have been broken like this before? What do you see when you see those people? What do you think Jesus sees when he sees those people? Jesus came for scum. He came for sinners. And he never saw people as problems. He saw people with problems. He never saw people who were, were worthless. He saw people who were broken and needed a doctor. And yet sometimes we look at people. We see them on the news. We see them when they walk in the doors of our church. Hopefully not, but sometimes we do, don't we? And we go, whoa. What are you doing here? Alert the security team. Because <laughs> uh, this, this person doesn't belong. But Jesus said, I'm here for sinners. I'm here for broken people. He came into a world that was plagued by sin. And he hated the disease. But he never hated the people that were infected with it. In, in the metaphor that he used, he said, I'm a doctor. Now, do we criticize doctors for being at the hospital? I mean, even in the coronavirus where we're supposed to social distance and, and, and stay away. Do we criticize the doctors for being at the hospital? No, because that's right where we expect them to be in the midst of with sick people. And Jesus said, then why are you criticizing me for being with these sinners. I'm a doctor. It's where I'm supposed to be. And people call Jesus a bunch of names. I mean, they slander him. A glutton, a fake. Oh, hail the king of the Jews. But there was one slander that they threw at Jesus that he owned. Remember what that one was? They called him the friend of church people. Remember that? It's really good to know that, that because we're sitting in the pews, that makes Jesus our friend. Wait a second. No, 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 wait. I got that wrong. It was the friend of sinners. And he said, you know what? Yeah, that's me. They saw that as a degrading thing. And Jesus said, no, that's exactly right. I own that. That's who I am. And, and he was. He loved to be, look, he didn't just come and see people as his patients who needed to get a cure. He saw people who were sick and he genuinely liked to be around them. You know what I'm saying? It's not like I'm just going to go up to the church and I'm going to hand out some free stuff to somebody and then go, whew, I'm glad that's done so that I can go and actually enjoy my time. Jesus loved to be around the broken people. Look at Luke chapter, I believe it's 15 and verse 1. It says, now, you there? Good. Now the tax collectors and sinners were all gathering around to hear him. 
But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, look, they still missed it. It says, this man welcomes sinners and tax collectors and eats with them. <coughs> Even by the time you get to Luke 15, they still don't understand it. <laughs> Jesus is saying, yeah, that's exactly what I'm doing because I came for sinners. But Jesus, he was a friend of sinners. He liked to be with them, and they liked to be with him too, and they're seeking him out. How cool is that? The broken people of the earth wanted to be around Jesus. A lot of people are turned off by religion today. You ever heard somebody, they, they, they say, I don't go to church. Because church is full of what? It's full of hypocrites. Well, of course it is. I mean, this is a hospital and we're all sick patients who need a doctor. And look, I understand. There are some people in our church, and, and, and hopefully not in our church family, but in the churches who sit, and, and they're not trying to get better. They're not trying to get well. But a lot of us are. A lot of us are. And Jesus said, that's why I came. But some of us, we, we, we're uncomfortable with, with that thought. Well, let me, let me just share it like this. Jesus didn't practice separation for fear of contamination. You know what I'm saying? Can, can I? He didn't social distance. Right? He didn't, he didn't quarantine them or isolate them. But look, I get the tension. I really do. I understand the tension here. Because as you're listening to this, you may be uh, thinking to yourself, a very good thought, a very scriptural thought, and I've preached sermons about this kind of stuff, and I will again. This is not that message, but there are times where that message is appropriate. Look, when I was young and I was a kid, my parents didn't just let me watch whatever I wanted to or go wherever I wanted to go or listen to whatever music I wanted to listen to. And I'd get upset. I'd be like, Why can't I go? All my friends are going. And my parents would say, because you're not mature enough yet. You're not ready for that kind of stuff because if you surround yourself with that kind of filth, then that kind of filth is going to infiltrate you and contradict the faith we're trying to instill in you. And so they just wouldn't let me go out and do that kind of stuff. I understand that. I preach lessons on the fact that bad company corrupts good morals. I get it. I understand that. I understand that if you're an alcoholic and you've been an alcoholic for years of your life, but then you come to Christ... You have a responsibility to go into witness and share Jesus with your drinking friends. But you don't need to do that at a bar. I get it. I understand that. But here's the thing. How can the kingdom of God ever come to people who are far from God if the people of God are avoiding them? It's never going to work. Jesus' response to sin was not isolation. It was incarnation. He said, I am here with you in the midst of your sin. Not to just help you deal with your own sin, but to heal you from it. But if we're so busy social distancing and wearing a mask, spiritually speaking, not against the social distance and wearing the mask for the coronavirus. I'm talking on a spiritual level. Then how will the kingdom of God ever come to broken people if we're too scared to be around them because they might influence us? You know, we can, we can deal with people who show up to the office and they're broken because there's like four of the staff up here, but don't, don't come to church. If you come to church, you need to put on a suit and a tie. You know, you need, to, you need to look the part. You know, stand when we stand, sit when we sit. And don't, don't say amen too, too loud because, you know, especially if you're a woman, because if you say amen in the church service while there are men present, then that would be wrong. But this person's life is broken and that's what we're worried about? Jesus was a friend of sinners and they liked to be around Him. And it wasn't because He came in and started poking and pressing and telling them, well, you need to stop doing this and you need to stop doing that. It's because He loved them. He loved to be around them. I, I, I mean, look, you, you got your middle school son. Can I tell all the mothers something? Can I just let you know a secret? As a former minister, youth minister, I, I understand this really well. Alan, you, you do too. When your son or daughter gets to middle school, they're going to learn a whole lot of new words. 
You follow me? And they're not good words. And they might not use them around you. But they know them. And they've learned them. And so, you know, my, my younger brother um, has... Uh, when he was earlier in school, he really had a tough time for a while because he had some friends. And these friends called themselves Christians. And he was at a Christian school. But then all his friends started cussing. And they started using this bad language. And so he was torn between, what am I going to do? I'm just going to have to find new friends. But what if the solution isn't that I have to find new friends because my other friends are cussing friends? What if it's the truth that I... Don't cuss like my cussing friends do. And I don't like that my cussing friends like to cuss. But I like my cussing friends. Because if I just separate myself completely, then how are they ever going to know that it's okay to be cool and not cuss? You follow that? This is a different kind of message. A lot of times I, I, I love the holiness of God. And you will hear me once again preach on the holiness of God. And the standard for our holiness is, is to be as holy as we want to be. Is that, that what God set it up as? Are you awake? It's to be as holy as He is holy. That's the level of holiness. Paul was preaching on grace. And the natural response to grace is fear. Because it sounds too good. It sounds too good that I can just accept whoever they are with whatever lifestyle they've got and allow them to enter into our church building and have a relationship with the king. Wait a second. If you're going to go before the king, you need to get dressed up and you need to look your best because you're going to see the king. You know, the only time Jesus mentioned clothes was when he was telling the Pharisees that they were wearing too many. Holiness is important. Sin is bad. Sin is, sin is terrible. But Jesus came for the sick. The sin-filled. Jesus, He said, I didn't come for the righteous. Jesus didn't come for the righteous because the righteous didn't need a doctor. Jesus didn't come to the righteous because there would be nobody to call. Romans chapter 3 and verse 10 says, No one is righteous, not even one. Romans 3.23, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. I'm not, again, I'm not claiming sin's not that bad. I'm saying none of us are that good. We're all sick. But I've got some good news. You want to hear it? Jesus came for sinners. Listen to one of the most important verses that I believe is in all of Scripture. It's 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 21. I love this Scripture. Listen to this. God made Him who had no sin to be sin for us. So that in Him, we might become the righteousness of God. We can have a right standing with our God. We can have a right relationship with Him. Not because we're good enough or practice all the right things and play church the right way. But because we love a Redeemer. Who didn't just come to take your sin and, and, and help you learn to cope with it. He came to become your sin. So why did Jesus come? That's our question in the series. Thy kingdom come. Jesus, why are you here? I came for sinners. And how are you going to save sinners who have sin when sin leads to what? If sin leads to death, then how am I going to save a bunch of sinners? Jesus, therefore, came to become sin. He didn't come to dismiss sin. He came to destroy sin. He didn't say, I'll become a sinner like you. He said, I will become your sin for you. That's the good news of the gospel, ladies and gentlemen. So on the cross, the sinless doctor hung. 
And, and during the day, the sky got dark. It was in that moment that Jesus looks up to heaven and he cries out and he, he says, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And for the first time in all of eternity, the Godhead was disjointed. The Father abandoned the Son. And wrath from heaven was poured out on Jesus because the King had become sin. The King didn't come to sweep your sin under the rug. He came to take your sin and put it on the cross. He said, I came for sinners like you and like me. Listen, there's never been a doctor like King Jesus. He made the house call. He diagnosed the disease. He provided the only cure. And He paid the bill in full. And He wants to be your King. So here's the question for you today. Are you sick of being sick? Are you sick of pretending that everything's okay in your life when you're sick? Are you sick of being sick? You remember those two guys that I spoke of earlier, Mike and Trent? Both of those guys recognized that they were sick. And they said, I'm sick of being sick. And they both looked to the cross and they found healing through a doctor who hung there for them. And they both chose to make Jesus their king. And now they're both full-time preachers in churches working in the kingdom of God. Listen, the message is simple. His name is Jesus. And He is your king. And He came for sinners like you. I don't care who you are or what you've done. I don't have to know you because I know Him. And He came for you. So, are you ready to surrender your life to Him? And, and more importantly, are you ready to give up your own kingdom to follow Him and to step into the kingdom of God? You can only have and serve one master, one king, one lord. You can only be a part of one kingdom. So, which are you going to choose today? Listen to me, if, if you haven't surrendered your life to Jesus yet, and you haven't given your life to Him, but you're coming and you're sitting in these pews and you're a part of the church, but, but you really don't have Jesus as your King, you're crazy for being here. Go build your own kingdom. Go live your life to the full. I mean, if, if Jesus isn't Lord to you, then, then, then go do something else. But if you believe, like my bracelet said, in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, and if you believe that the King is coming back and that He's going to host a wedding banquet for a bunch of unfit people, then you would be crazy not to surrender everything you have to that King. His name is Jesus, and He's your King. So what are you going to choose? I hope that you choose to say, with Jesus, Thy kingdom come. Not my kingdom come. Think about it if you need to respond. Won't you come? Why together we stand and sing?